Images of Auschwitz, Treblinka, Elzek, Sobibor, and Nazi attempts to annihilate the Jewish people were originally filmed almost entirely in black and white. But for the first time, some of these images are being transformed into color. Colorizations can get the image closer to what it actually was. I've seen it and I, I can't erase it in my mind. Auschwitz is a story that should never be allowed to fade from memory. I couldn't talk about what I went through for about 50 years. Once we entered there, we thought we'd entered hell. All I see is guards yelling at us, get out quickly, take nothing with you. In the distance, I see flames coming out of chimneys. I said, when will I see my mother? And she looked at the chimney, and she said, your mother is burning there. You better talk about her in past tense. Anybody that survived the camp will live forever. Among the last remaining survivors of the Holocaust are the stories of a world lost and a life denied. I grew up in this shtetl in the Carpathian Mountains. There was a very vibrant Jewish Hasidic community. Life was good. I was born in Sherad, in central Poland. My father was a bootmaker, made officers' boots. My mother's family came from Spain. In 1394, they came to Poland. My father was the chazan of the town, the cantor. My mother was a housewife. We were 11 children, and you can imagine every meal, what it took to prepare. I was born in Czechoslovakia. Our family was in that area about 100 years. In fact, a town in one of that area, Bohorodchana, which means where God was born. Most survivors alive today were children at the time of the Holocaust. But they did not escape being brutally uprooted from their homes, witnessing appalling horrors, and having their childhood denied. These are stories about resilience, defiance, and the enduring human spirit. They are the voices of those who lived. They made holes in my skin, and then they, uh, they put ink over it, and, um, and then the number stuck, P7608. Had you ever thought of having it removed? No. 
I have nothing to be ashamed of. The Germans should be ashamed of what they did. I have nothing to be ashamed of. Why should they remove it? Eastern Europe was home to about seven million Jews, a majority of the world's Jewish population. Poland had the largest community of around three million. By 1945, after 12 years of Nazi rule, the vast majority of Europe's Jews had been murdered. The seeds of Auschwitz may have been planted in the dust of World War I. Germany's defeat in 1918 was followed by national humiliation, economic collapse, and political chaos. Die-hard nationalists and a World War I soldier named Adolf Hitler set out to rewrite history. They slandered 70,000 Jewish soldiers, claiming cowardice on the front lines led to a collapse of morale and Germany's defeat. My father was in the Austro-Hungarian army, part of Germany and Austro-Hungary together. Uh, he spent three and a half years on the Russian front. My husband's father was officially declared a hero of the First World War, and he had a whole string of medals. The emerging Nazi party claimed that Germany wasn't defeated militarily, but stabbed in the back by Jewish politicians, who threw in the towel. Proportionately, based on their numbers, more Jews got iron crosses during World War I than any other group. 12,000 Jews died fighting for the fatherland. And in the face of recorded Jewish bravery, the Nazis dishonored Jewish soldiers for political gain. My father in 1919 was a decorated hero. 25 years later, I, his son, was in a cattle car to Auschwitz. In 1920, with the establishment of the Nazi party, a 25-year campaign of vicious anti-Jewish hatred began. Less than 1% of the population was Jewish. There were areas the size of Wales who had never seen a Jew. And it wasn't just Jewish soldiers and Jewish politicians that were blamed for Germany's ills. Jewish bankers were blamed for economic collapse. The myth that the Jews control the economy and so on is, is, is what unfortunately is, it is true fake news. <laughs> the idea of the National Workers' Party was trying to put some pride again into being Germans, not to feel that they had lo not only lost the war, but that practically the right of existence. In the beginning, it was very much propaganda that had an appeal. Make Germany first, make Germany great. In Vilnius, Lithuania, formerly Vilna, Poland, only a few Jewish residents ended up in Auschwitz. Jews were brought to the Ponar Forest, outside the city, and shot dead into pits. An annual memorial service marks the Nazi liquidation in September 1943 of the embattled Jewish quarter. It was one of a handful of communities that organized armed resistance to the Nazi death camps. To some, Fanny Brantowski is a national hero. <laughs> Fania fought with the Jewish partisans and together with Soviet troops helped liberate Vilna in July of 1944. <laughs> 
Geschäft. Wir haben, sag ich, mit zu verteidigen dem Covid von unserem Volk und zu nehmen, nicht kommen. In dem Foto von der Familie, only I live. Before World War II, Wilna was nicknamed Poland's Jerusalem. Von der ersten Tag, wenn die Deutschen seine Reihen, haben sie sich gemüht zu liquidieren, alles was ist verbunden gewesen mit der jüdischen Kultur. Wilna was such an incredibly vibrant society with so many artists, musicians, writers, uh, actors, and so on. Genocide at Auschwitz ran parallel to cultural genocide in places such as Vilna, which stood out as a unique center of Jewish learning. It was home to dozens of synagogues, boasting five Yiddish language newspapers and a university where students could study physics, chemistry, or Latin in Yiddish. In Ghetto is given a bibliothek. Is given sehr populär. In the decades before World War II, Yiddish language literature flourished with more than 30,000 publications. It may have been one of the most creative periods of Jewish literary history, but many of its readers would be murdered at Auschwitz. The Yiddish language was at the heart of Jewish identity and culture throughout Eastern Europe. The last words of many of those annihilated at Auschwitz would be in Yiddish. I didn't think I had any chance to survive. I was left there to die because they told I was dead. I couldn't even stand up on my feet. Can you imagine 72 pounds? In 1933, Hitler seized power and a Nazi culture war against Jewish influence intensified. It included attacks on prominent writers, artists, musicians, and intellectuals. Das Zeitalter eines überspitzten jüdischen Intellektualismus ist nun zu Ende. Der Durchbruch der deutschen Revolution hat auf dem deutschen Weg wieder die Gasse freigemacht. There was one book the Nazis were unlikely to burn. It was the most viciously anti-Semitic storybook for children ever written. There's a particular book, it's called The Poison Mushroom, which is a children's book about Jews. This is where you begin. You begin through education. So that begins for Ernest. Six years later, the 10-year-old now is 16 years old. The 12-year-old is now 18 years old, ready to go into the army. In 1933, the Nazis opened their first concentration camp at Dachau. It was initially used for communists and other political enemies. Some Roma would also be given their first experience of a Nazi concentration camp. In 1933, New Nazi laws would lead to the total exclusion of Jews from the German economy. Similar laws would be adopted by Germany's European allies. Nazi party comes into power in January of 1933, and April 1st, Germany declares a boycott against Jewish businesses. In time, virtually all Jewish-owned businesses were confiscated, and most Jews forced out of work. This social and economic hell would precede the hell of Auschwitz. In 1935, the Nazis decreed the infamous racial supremacy Nuremberg laws. 
designed to protect the purity of German blood. I went to the German grammar school. I by now had to leave school because you shouldn't be so educated over 16s. You shouldn't have intellectual pretensions. You should learn a practical trade. I wanted to be a gymnast and be competing with the Olympics. I had the kind of a body I was told that is very flexible and I could be a candidate for the Olympics. I spent at least five hours a day training, training, training. I would never go to bed unless I did the split and stretching and training. And then I was told by my trainer that I have to train someone else who is not Jewish. And that was, to me, the biggest shock of my life. The Nuremberg Laws stripped Jews of German citizenship and outlawed sexual relations and marriage between Jews, Roma, and Germans. My parents had fallen in love and they wanted to marry. My father was Jewish, my mother was not. And for that, you would be uh, paraded in public with insulting slogans hung around your neck. So they fled to the Netherlands. These Nazi racial supremacy laws justified racial breeding and the forced sterilizations of Roma women. The Roma way of life would face annihilation by the Nazis. Some Nazi scientists believe the Roma were genetically predisposed to criminality and traditional Roma families who freely traveled around the countryside were considered a security threat. La vie euh, que j'avais quand j'étais jeune, mon père tenait un cirque et un cinéma. On vivait bien. On apportait la joie, la gaieté dans le pays et on était bien reçus partout. Moi, j'étais clown, acrobate et trompettiste. C'est mon père qui en parlait. Comme lui, il avait fait la guerre 14, tout ça, il voyait que ça allait se tourner au tragique, quoi. Alors, euh, il disait, tiens, ça va recommencer. Euh. In November 1938, any doubts about the Nazis' violent intentions towards the Jews ended. A night of Nazi terror left a thousand German synagogues burned down or vandalized leaving about a hundred Jews dead. It was called Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. The path towards Auschwitz and the final solution was foreshadowed. the Germans coming into Poland. One year after Kristallnacht, in September 1939, the Nazis invaded Poland. Hitler promised to regain Germany's lost empire following its defeat in World War I. I was a boy of 10. The Germans came with tanks and the Polish army went in with horses. It was wonderful to see all these Polish soldiers. Unfortunately, the uh, Polish army had very few tanks, very few heavy machine guns. They made a stand, but it didn't last. Within about two days, they were uh, overrun by the German army. Germany invaded Poland from the west, but also from the south. Slovakia was in the south of Poland. So the German army marched under my window. 
All of a sudden, you couldn't buy a piece of chocolate in my whole town. My parents talked about the Germans, and they occupied our town in the First World War. They were tolerant. This lot, when they came in 1939, uh, was just unbelievable. To feed a voracious war machine, the Nazis began to round up thousands of able-bodied Jewish men and older children. My father was taken to a work camp in Krakow. My mom didn't want to go into hiding. She brought her son, my, my brother, with her. And she wanted a way to take care of him and herself. And she volunteered to cook in the work camp. And the irony is that my parents had a professional cook. I don't even know if she knew how to cook. They were transferred from at least three camps. When they moved, they moved together to another camp. Middle of the night, a German policeman and a Jewish policeman came, and they said, because your father escaped and your brother escaped, you will have to come. Within months, the Nazis established dozens of forced labor camps across occupied Poland. At 11 years old, I went to that camp. It was called Otocno. I didn't know what I was getting in for because I remember camps. We used to go, we used to stay in tents, and uh, we used to enjoy ourselves, and I thought that was a camp. They were building a railway line for the attack on Russia. The Otoczno camp was in west-central Poland, near the city of Poznan. We started with two and a half thousand men, all Jewish. Within 18 months, there was only 11 people left alive. Every week, they were hanging people for just next to nothing. People threw themselves under the railway line as the railway line passed, they just threw themselves on there. They couldn't take it anymore. Soon after invading Poland, the Nazis established the first urban prison zone. They called a ghetto. The ghettos were encircled with walls, fences, and checkpoints. Eventually, over 800 were established in Nazi-occupied Europe. Jewish families would be forcibly uprooted from their homes and sent to the nearest ghetto. Conditions of extreme overcrowding, starvation, and disease deteriorated rapidly. The Nazis filmed these scenes of extreme human misery and degradation to prove that Jews were really no different from vermin. The ghettos were midway between a world that was lost forever and the hell of the death camps to come. Within a year after the invasion of Poland, Auschwitz was open. In May 1940, Germany invaded the Netherlands. I lived with my parents near the center of Amsterdam. I did hear gunshots on the Rosengracht, the street which practically runs past the Anne Frank house. Both my parents were communists. My father tried to do what he could against the Nazis. He disappeared from our flat. And then my mum had gone into labor and he risked his life to get me off to an architect friend whilst my mum was in hospital giving birth. My mother died uh, from an infection. The couple who were looking after me must have known they were risking their lives. One day I was at the little school I went to and two young men walked in and one of them said, is Martin Stern here? And the teacher immediately answered, no, he hasn't come in today. And there I was, in the middle of the row of my classmates. And I didn't understand what was going on, so I put my hand up. 
The couple that had looked after me so wonderfully were arrested. The wife was released the next day, but the husband was sent to the horrific concentration camp of Neuengamme, just outside Hamburg in Germany. My sister and I landed in a prison camp in the Netherlands called Westerbork. I was five years old when I was arrested by the Nazis. First thing I remember being told is you see that barbed wire fence, don't go near it. The soldiers in those watchtowers will shoot you. Camp Westerbork was a holding facility in a rapidly growing network of over 800 concentration camps and subcamps. Most were camps where there was every chance of being worked to death. But a select few specialized in mass murder, Auschwitz being one of them. In June of 1940, the Nazis invade France. An occupation government would carry out the mass arrest of Jews and many Roma. Et le matin, 6 heures, les gendarmes français, ils ont mis tambouriné dans les portes de caravane. Mais on n'a pas été ramassé par les Allemands. Hein. On a été ramassé par le gouvernement français. Les tiganes en France dans les camps. C'est le camp de concentration, c'est la plaine, c'est la, la, la montagne, là, dans les bois. Là. By 1941, thousands of Roma had been arrested, including 15-year-old Raymond and his family. La misère, la froid, la faim, euh, manque d'hygiène, euh, manque de nourriture. Je suis resté un an là-haut au camp de condensation, mais après, je me suis évadé. Quand j'avais un peu de sous, j'achetais un peu au marché noir. J'allais la nuit et par-dessus, je sais, la nourriture par-dessus le barbelé. In April 1941, the Luftwaffe bombs Belgrade. I have been just five years old. Suddenly, the bombs hit Belgrade. It was four o'clock in the morning. I will never ever forget that because it was a stampede of people. Everybody was pushing and all I can remember, my mother said, don't let go of my hand, don't let go of my hand. With German troops advancing on Belgrade, Dorit and her mother fled to Hungary. As Hungary was a German ally, it was not yet occupied by the Nazis but Jews remained in constant dread of what might happen. My mother bought three crosses, one for my grandmother, one for me, and a bigger one for her. I remember I was even jealous. I thought, why should she get a bigger cross than I? She kept it all the time with her. That saved her life many times. But when she was praying with it, she was praying Shema Israel. Shema Israel. In June of 1941, Germany invades the Soviet Union, helped by rail lines laid by Jewish forced labor. They go into villages, towns, and cities. They gather the Jews, march them out into the field or into a ravine or into the forest, and they begin the process of doing what they said they're going to do, eliminate the Jews of Europe. Eric beat the odds to survive 18 months at a Tochno work camp. While he was away, his family were forced to settle in the Lurch ghetto, where he rejoined them. When I arrived in Lodge ghetto, it was surrounded by barbed wire guarded by German assessment with guns. 
Uh, there was 160,000 people in the Lodz ghetto. The Germans picked some people with beards, Hasidic people, and they cut their beard off, and the other soldiers stood around and laughed and joked about it. And I bought that in the square. I've seen it a few times. Ordinary people died in the street, on the, on the pavement. People just passed by, didn't do anything about it. Conditions in the ghetto was terrible. Starvation and disease. And I was at home for two weeks. Then they liquidated the ghetto. Eventually there were 4,000 people in a church, quite a small church. In search of water, Alex lived outside. The assessment shouted at me, one assessment, and he says, what's your profession? I said, I was a tailor. Rouse? Arik was ordered to join a small group of men being sent back to the ghetto. By pretending to be a tailor when only 13 years old, he cheated death again. My mother was in the church with my brother and my two sisters. On that day, I lost about 18. Uh, of my family. Arik was now an orphan in the Lodge ghetto, surviving on his wits. The SS wanted 4,000 children to be sent away, and I knew basically what that meant. And when I heard that, I hid in a cemetery behind the tombstone and I did it for about four days, and eventually got the 4,000 children, and they took him to Chelmno, and they gassed them. In 1941, Chelmno, in central Poland, is where mass murder using gas first began. After that, in the ghetto, it was quiet. I went onto the pavement. I sat down and I cried. Resistance to the Nazis in the ghettos risked arrest and public hanging. As the Nazis battled the Allies, mass killings of Jews took place in the provinces. In urban areas, restrictions on Jews escalated. Valuables were stolen to pay for the war effort, and anything in short supply would be commandeered. Day by day came order after order. At first, it was just jewelry, and then next, it was the radios, then the telephones. Typewriters were also to be uh, had Anything that you could think of, bizarre things, kitchen mortars, bicycles, ladders. The prohibition against owning pets uh, could make sense if you interpret it as yet an additional way of making life unpleasant and intolerable for Jews. Make them want to leave. That's what the Nazis were originally after. Armed resistance developed in the Warsaw Ghetto, as well as in Minsk, Bialystok, Krakow, and outside Vilna. The first word for no need is given the gedank as we have kämpfen in ghetto. In ghetto, in the killer, um, as we learned, she's. Vilna, now called Vilnius, had its own underground resistance movement. An 18 year old Fania escaped the Vilna ghetto the day before it was liquidated to join the Jewish partisans in the forest. When the Russian army started to get closer and closer, Germans were losing uh, the war. 
they decided to accelerate the liquidation of the ghetto. Samuel and his parents were in the Vilna ghetto with the last remaining families and their children. We were about 200, 200 or more children. And, and we were told to go out into the courtyard and then the children were thrown on trucks and taken for annihilation. My father managed to hide me. He put me in a sack on his shoulder. He carried me out to a small building on the limit of the camp. And he lowered me from the sack to the ground and uh, told me to run. And this was my goodbye to my father, just feeling the warmth of his body, but being on his back. In 1944, the Nazis faced military defeat. Hitler's ally, Hungary, was under threat from the Soviet army. There were two wars going on, one against the Allies and another war against the Jews. Two separate sets of people are working the problem. In spite of the Nazis beginning to lose the war, their efforts to annihilate the remaining Jews of Europe escalated. The Jews of Europe, by the spring of 1944, there were no masses of Jews left anywhere except in Hungary. Passover in 1944, the Hungarians announced that all the Jews have to gather in the yard of the synagogue. They're allowed to take only 25 pounds per person. It was 6.30 in the morning. We were suddenly told to pack our luggage. Take with us only our valuables in a small suitcase. Take all your money. Take all your jewels. We were packing feverishly documents, religious items. We had Passover dinner. My father got up and kissed us. And then in the morning, we were picked up. They were taking us. We were four children, my mother, my father, my grandfather, my grandmother, and my uncle. My father took his prayer shawl and his prayer book. My mother didn't want to go. She said, I don't want them to kill me. I'm going to drink something. We had all kind of 96% liquor and all kind of things. And I said, Mommy, you always have time to die. And so we convinced her, and we started marching. They took us through main streets, and that's one thing that I'll never forget, that there were people walking on both sides of the street, and they looked at us as if we were ghosts. They completely ignored us, and that was terrible. That was a terrible feeling. My mother, myself, my two sisters, my aunts, my cousins, and their children, we were all born into that so-called ghetto. They made us wear a yellow star. We felt terribly humiliated. People made fun of us. I did wear it, but I covered it up. My mother was a blonde woman with blue eyes. People told me many times, you're so lucky because you don't look Jewish. The nightmare of the ghettos was a glimpse of what was to come. I don't think I was developed emotionally well enough to understand the impending doom. It seemed to be incredible that the day I was supposed to get married, I found myself pushed into a cattle wagon.
I think we were just stunned. Certainly I was, because I thought this is just not happening. I couldn't believe it was happening. There were about a um, hundred people in the wagon. We had to stand up. We couldn't even sit down. Body to body, no water, no sanitation. That bucket was the only sanitation. There was no windows. The only light which came through the wooden cracks of the cattle car, and I cannot tell you what a terrible journey that was. The train was going very slow. The first night, a man dies. We ask the SS man, what do we do with the body? Put him in a corner. There was no corner. People were screaming and went berserk. They were screaming. They were hitting others. They went out of their mind. My mom in the cattle car hugged me and said, we don't know where we're going. We don't know what's going to happen. Just remember, no one can take away from you what you put here in your own mind. And that's exactly what happened. Everything was taken away from me. Cattle cars crammed with several thousand people arrived at the Nazis' most notorious extermination camp, Auschwitz. Out comes this tall, very handsome man with the shiny boots and a rubber stick in his hand. He points to my knees to go to the left, to me to go to the left and the rest of them are marching on. And as I pass my father's row, he put his hand on my head, as he did every Friday night after he came back from the shore. And he blessed me. He said, Judy, you will live. These were the last words that I heard from my father. This is the last time that I saw. He asked, is this your mother or is this your sister? And I did not forgive myself by saying, that's my mother. So he points, Dr. Mengele points my mother to go this way and my sister and I. And there I was with a couple an inmate, she threw my earrings out and I was bleeding. And I said, when will I see my mother? And she looked at the chimney and she said, your mother is burning there. You better talk about her in past tense. The spirit never dies. <laughs> 